I'm glad everyone has been able to get their box lunch and uh, to uh, prepare themselves to hear from an extraordinary writer who's such an inspiration, um, both personally and professionally. Um, just um, a beautiful spirit which comes through in all of her work. Um, I think that there was a collective cheer that went out in the entire writing community back in January when Susan Orlean, the author of The Orchid Thief, the beloved Orchid Thief, um, blogged to the world that she had completed the manuscript on her next book. <laughs> and I was one of them. And I'd like to uh, uh, ask and introduce uh, my esteemed colleague, Chris Daly, Professor Chris Daly, a professor here at uh, the College of Communication in the Department of Journalism, and a longtime friend and colleague of Susan's to introduce her sure. to us. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Isabel. It's a, it's a real pleasure to do this. Uh, but of course, you know, Susan is the epitome of someone who needs no introduction, certainly not uh, in this crowd. But I, I do think it's important for us to, uh, to realize that we are Welcoming Susan back to Boston. This is a place where she has spent a good deal of uh, good years uh, of her life, uh, living here, working at the Neiman, and uh, starting a family. And lots of lots of good things are associated with with this city for her. Um, as most of you know, uh, Susan has been a staff writer at the New Yorker since 1992. Um, and over those years, uh, you know, I've been very pleased to see. Uh, just an incredible um, proliferation of uh, interests and enthusiasms on her part, which makes it so uh, so much fun to uh, pay attention to her. And uh, as Isabel also mentioned, one of her enthusiasms will be culminating in October when her book about Rin Tin Tin uh, is published, Rin Tin Tin, The Life and the Legend. So that's something to look forward to. Around the same time, uh, her publisher is smartening up and is going to be reissuing uh, one of her early works, Saturday Night, uh, in both uh, print and ebook formats. So these are a lot of things to look forward to uh, in that gift buying season of the year. So that's all coming up. But I, I wanted to say one thing uh, about Susan that um, has really struck me recently, uh, and that is she also epitomizes a lot of the things that we've been hearing. Uh, at this conference today in terms of uh, leaning in, uh, being experimental, being open to new uh, activities, thoughts, uh, at reinventing oneself. Now, we don't have to go all the way into becoming uh, agriculturalists like Susan has done, but I, I think of her as someone who has really embraced uh, a lot of the new media. And for me, uh, this was really crystallized one day when I was playing around with Twitter uh, wasting, not, not, I shouldn't say wasting, spending time on Twitter. And uh, I kept wondering, what is this thing good for? Like, what, what, am I, am I missing something? And then there was a tweet from Susan who said that she had just found the TV remote control in her <laughs> handbag. <laughs> she was wondering, what the hell am I doing with this? And then it occurred to me, that's what Twitter is good for. It's good for just about anything. So, Susan, thank you for that. <laughs> And uh, over to you. I'd like to clarify, it wasn't in my handbag. It was in my husband's suitcase. <laughs> and I think many women here would appreciate that, the fact that that suitcase had, was from a trip that had occurred several weeks earlier. So more on that later. Um, Thanks a lot, Chris, and thank you especially to Isabel Wilkerson, who is so extraordinary and who invited me here. I'm very happy to be here and really thrilled to be part of this conference with some of the people who I admire and like so much, um, incredible people, everyone from Jill Abramson to Ken Aletta and so on. It's a pretty fantastic group, so I'm thrilled to be part of it. Um, before I go any further, I want to make two announcements. One is um, 
the part of Rintintin will not be played by Meryl Streep. <laughs> Actually, I won't make any other announcements. I think that probably <laughs> takes care of all of them. But um, journalism is dead. Publishing is dead. Books, dead. Newspapers, really dead. Magazines, life support. Anyway, that's what we hear, right? And that is the refrain that's been playing for the last few years. Very gloomy assessment of what it is that we all love to do. For a while, I actually was following a Twitter account called The Media is Dying. It posted every day the list of who had gotten laid off where. And then I thought for my mental health, it may be better not to. But in the face of all that, the one interesting thing that you never hear, no matter how dire these predictions are of what's going on in, in the world of, of writing, no one ever says that stories are dead. Never. No one ever says that storytelling is dead. Because in fact, if anything, I think stories and storytelling are thriving like they've never thrived before. I think that there's an appetite for stories that is far greater than it's ever been. I mean, if you think for a minute, there are how many blogs out there in the world? I mean, somebody once counted this, and then like grains of sand, there were so many more that popped up while they were being counted that it's uncountable. So you may say a lot of them are terrible, but why do they even exist? It's because people want to tell stories and they want to hear stories. So in spite of all of these predictions of gloom, I feel like this has never been a better time to be a teller of stories. Stories thrive. They last. It's what matters. It's the basic fiber of, of human interaction. And while it's clear that the, the sort of mechanism of how stories are being sent out in the world um, is in a lot of upheaval. I think what's really important as we're sitting together as writers is to just remember that the basic fact of what we do and what we love to do and why we're doing it is not threatened. The, the packaging is changing, but the basic content is not. Sometimes, actually, as an aside, I'll say people say, well, I want to have a conversation with you about how you feel about e-books and e-books versus print books. And I, I feel like, why do we even set it up as a battle? We're talking about, do you like a manila envelope or a white envelope? What's, it's a delivery system. I love books. I don't care what form they're in. I think that um, what's, what's really important right now is to remember why you love being a writer and to push further back in your mind all of the issues about the industry, the format, the method of delivery. And that's a little easy to say when you're not worried about a job. But I also think if you're going to have this job as a writer, you've got to remember why you love it and why it's important. Because I, I really think it is an essential, vibrant, vigorous, and entirely exciting way to spend your life. Now, it used to be that writers were explorers. What they had to offer was they had the time and the nerve and, in some cases, the uh, underwriting 
to go places no one else could go. You'd go, you'd, you'd see a place that other people didn't have a chance to see or talk to a person other people didn't have a chance to talk to, and you'd come back and you'd tell the story. And that was actually a wonderful, easy way to feel valued because you were doing something that other people couldn't do. Now we're in the age of access. Everybody has access to everything. So then, in that kind of world, what is a writer's stock and trade? What is it that we can offer? Because it's not that we can offer newness anymore or opportunity, since anybody can do anything. You know, the day that I saw that Google Earth could scroll in, zoom in rather, to a street level in Paris, I thought, all right, now I have to think. What is it that that I can do as a writer, I, I can't even describe a place that other people aren't going to because they can go to it. And I'm glad that I had that frightening moment because it reminded me that, that while that's a valuable thing to do, it isn't the only thing we do. And in many ways, it's not the most important thing we do. I mean, now that people can really go out in the world it's been a long time since a writer, except for people doing combat reporting, were doing things that simply weren't available to other people. That's, that isn't what makes us special. What I think I'd love to think about and talk about and encourage you to think about is the aspect of storytelling that's emotional. That what we can do in this age of enormous access, of overwhelming supply of information and data and imagery, is to become essentially the curators and docents of the experience of life. To bring people to it and help interpret it for them. And and bring them to the, exper the emotional experience of some of this information. Because the fact is, when my six-year-old the other day asked me a question and then hesitated and said, that's OK, I'll Google it, <laughs> I, I thought, all right, so maybe my role as a mother is no longer to have the answer to everything, because we now have a far better way to get those pieces of information. But I can do something important still. I mean, he can Google. The question was an important one, which is, um, if you shot a bullet at a helium truck, would it explode? I mean, you know. <laughs> and I, he caught me short. I just wasn't, <laughs> you know, and as I was fumbling, um, feeling like a failure, um, he said, that's OK, Mom, we'll Google it. And I thought, well, but maybe I can tell him a story about, uh, it, you know, a time that I uh, shot a balloon with a, pen a sharpened pencil or make something of this other than simply having the information. And I thought, really, that's, that's what I do. I try to go past the simple matter of delivering knowledge. It's very funny because I, I find myself asking all the time as I'm writing, how do I get to be the person telling this story? And even more than that, I'm often, I have this persistent feeling of, gee, anybody could go look this up. Have any of you ever had that feeling as you're writing? And you think, really, I, I'm writing this story. I went to the library. I did the research, or I talked to the person. But anyone could do it. And I think it's something that, as a writer, you always are confronting, which is, so what, what is it that I'm doing that's special, if anyone can look this up? And I have to tell you, I, this was something that dogged me forever as I was uh, writing The Orchid Thief. It, it dogs me in each and every piece I do for The New Yorker, and it absolutely was on my mind the whole time that I was writing Rin Tin Tin because so much of the material was archival, and I thought, really, anyone could go get this. And there was a really simple answer, which was, but they aren't. 
And moreover, I feel that I can get this information and I can spin it into something richer than simply saying, you can look it up. And that's where being a storyteller comes in. It's not just gathering the information. It's, it's making it a yarn, making it a story that has an arc. That, and that's where it struck me that what matters is leading people through the emotional experience of learning, of learning something new, learning something about the world, learning something new about, in many cases, something they thought they already knew, which is, to me, one of the most exciting kinds of stories to do, to say, you think you know this, give it a second thought, I'm going to take you through it in a different way, or, as is often the case for me, saying, I know you don't think you need to know about taxidermy, but you'll be surprised. It's important that you learn about this. And the challenge then is to draw people into learning something they didn't think they wanted to care about. The book that I just finished, Rintintin, Tin, is in a, in a way when I, f I came to the end of the writing, I realized that in many ways the story is all about the power and persistence of stories. I mean, the reason that I got drawn in, frankly, was I had sort of stumbled across the name Rintintin Tin in the course of working on another piece and discovered, to my complete surprise, that Rintintin was not merely a 1950s television character, but in fact a real dog who had been born on a battlefield in World War I, and who, in fact, both as a real dog and then ultimately as a, as a character, had persisted now for nearly 100 years. In fact, at one point I thought, if I go any slower on the book, it really will be 100 years. So. Maybe that'll be my excuse when I'm asking for yet another extension. I'm just trying to make a nice round number here. He, he was born in 1918. I thought I could turn the book in in 2018. <laughs> that works, right? So what really compelled me is thinking, why did this character last for this long? Why has it persisted in our sort of collective uh, cultural memory for almost a hundred years. Why did the character of this dog find a place in silent films, in talking films, radio, books, comic books, vaudeville? What, what is it about certain things that last? And I just want to read you a, sh a little short section from the book, if I might, and um, because I realized I had I had kind of written about this, um, and before I read this, I just want to say that there, the book, uh, uh, there are three main characters, people, humans, who um, were really the people who sustained the character of Rin Tin Tin for these hundred years. So um, I will mention them in this little section. And their names are Lee, Bert, and Daphne. And I won't go into a big description of who they are, but I, I'll, when I refer to them, that's what, who they are. For me, the narrative of Rin Tin Tin is extraordinary because it has lasted. He is that rare thing that endures when so much else rushes past. He is the repeating mark in our memory, the line that dips and rises without breaking. It is the continuity of an idea that makes life seem like it has a pattern that is wise and beautiful and indelible, one thing leading to the next. The individual beads of our lives, rather than scattering and spilling, are gathered up and strung along that endless line. I believe there will always be a rent and tin because there will always be stories. He began as a story about surprise and wonder, a stroke of luck in a luckless time, and he became a fulfilled promise of perfect friendship. Then he became a way to tell stories that soared for years. He made people feel complete. I had started my own story by thinking that Lee and Bert and Daphne were curious specimens for their stubborn devotion. And then I realized that I was no different, elbowing my way into the chorus of narrators 
to advance the tale that much further, to become a part of what always means. I too had set out to be remembered. I'd wanted to create something permanent in my life, some proof that everything in its way mattered, that working hard mattered, that feeling things mattered, that even sadness and loss mattered because it was all part of something that would live on. I could read you the whole book if you want, but. <laughs> so what is, to use a really tacky marketing phrase, our value added as writers? Well, I, I really think that, especially when we're talking about narrative nonfiction, it really is that emotional piece of it. It's, yes, being a good reporter really matters, and I think everything springs from there. But then what people want, I believe, is that next level. Why should I care about this? What does it mean? What does it mean in the world to know this story? I mean, I've never written stories that were urgent. And much as I sometimes would have these pangs and think, I want to write that story about the nuclear meltdown in Japan, or I desperately wanted to go to Chechnya. I wanted to do these stories, but I realized out of a bunch of different reasons, those weren't the stories that I was going to end up doing. And when you're doing the stories that aren't urgent, I think it makes you think even more about that question of why bother? Why should anyone read this? For that matter, why should anyone write this? And these sound like really hard questions, but I think they're, for me, they're very galvanizing because I think because it's a great story and there's a story behind the story. There's a reason this matters. There's a wonderful lesson to learn about why certain people are passionate about something or about exploring a subculture that you might otherwise never be exposed to. Because that's what writing does. It transports you to a place emotionally that you may not ever go. And frankly, even though you could Google any of these things, it's important for us to remember as writers that people don't. They can, but they don't. So the access to that information shouldn't be, uh, I, I, I believe strongly that even though it's a question that will come up in your mind all the time, it shouldn't dampen your dedication and excitement about what you do. Because even though the access is there, it's, it doesn't mean people are out there gathering it. I think it still really matters to have a story told, whether the story is there to be gathered up on your own or not. So in this huge mass of information, you know, how do you choose stories? And a lot of people have said to me, what, what do you think is really important for a writer? I think, well, first of all, you have to have a tremendous, insatiable curiosity and a real desire to learn. Because really all I think I do is I get interested in a subject and I learn about it. And then being a bit of a loud mouth, I want to say to people, oh my god, I just learned the most amazing thing. And that's really what I do professionally. And I feel like, you know, it's a to me life is sort of an ongoing dinner party where I'm the person saying, oh God, you're not going to believe this. I just got back from the Worldwide Taxidermy Convention. And everyone goes, and I said, no, seriously, did you know that there are, it's the fastest growing profession outside of tattooing? <laughs> and I mean, seriously, the, and that's what I do. And you might leave that dinner party saying, wow, I sure did not think I was going to be talking about taxidermy tonight. But that's all right. I, I like the element of surprise in that as well. But that, I, I think that that's how I really look at narrative nonfiction. You've got to be the best learner, the most excited learner that you can possibly be, and then have a, a, a sort of 
infectious personality of saying, tugging on, on the, the collective um, coat sleeve of the public, saying, here's something amazing. Here's something really interesting. And in this cluttered world, that kind of voice still, I believe, cuts through because it's the most basic way we interact with one another is to be excited to share the stories of who we are and what we've learned. So in a way, I think for me, writing in the best sense is a very selfish pursuit. I, I get to learn about things I'm curious about. And when I have done assignments because I was given them and they were something that I thought, I mean, luckily it hasn't happened that much in my life because I think I always seemed so incapable of doing an assignment that I was told to do that most of my editors usually said, never mind, just go whatever it was you were going to do. Um, <laughs> But I've certainly done plenty of assignments in my life. And then, while it wasn't something where I thought, I'm dying to learn about the county legislature, I had to find in it some emotional drive to say, I, I'm going to find, you know, I love being a writer. And I love learning, even if it's about something really boring. And that, that's the, the momentum. That's the engine that drives those stories forward. I mean, in a perfect world, you only do the stories you really care about, but I know that that's not always the case. And it's easy to say, well, only do the ones you're excited about. But if they aren't the ones you're excited about, I think it, there's a huge value in finding that emotional drive of, I'm excited to be in a position of telling people stories, even the stories that are sometimes the workaday stories that end up in magazines and newspapers. But how do I settle on a story? I mean, the fact is that I'm interested in a sometimes sickening array of things that, um, and you know, then I just gauge it absolutely on how, how much am I interested in? How much am I dying to say to people, you're not going to believe this. You know, I just learned something incredible. And so it's absolutely a gut reaction rather than strategizing. People appear to be interested in chickens. I mean, <laughs> no. Uh, you know, that, or maybe yes, actually. But um, it, I think. All of this numbing bad news has made it hard to remember that being a writer is an extraordinary, joyful thing. The experience of learning and telling, of being, making your life a, a, a constant show and tell is so wonderful that as much as you possibly can push aside the issues of the industry as a whole, because I, I don't see what worrying about it gets us anyway. I mean, unless you're working on the corporate side of, of this world. Um, I think it's become harder and harder to remember the pure joy of learning and teaching. There are ways that, I mean, when I compare what it was like to, to publish a book in 1990 and now, I mean, it's a little bit like a se that scene in The Exorcist. I mean, my head is just whizzing around on my neck without the projectile vomiting, I should say. But, um, you know, it's a totally different world. So what do you do? I mean, a lot of times people say to me, whoa, you know, you've you've really kind of dealt with all of these changes. And I, I see it as all very integral to what I do anyway. Um, you know, I didn't understand Twitter when I first got on it. And then I started figuring out that these are just little mini, it's almost like haiku, that it's an opportunity for 
tiny stories, tiny moments, um, hoping my husband reads my tweet about finding the remote in his suitcase so in the future he won't leave it there. Um, <laughs> and, and also, honestly, the opportunity to talk to an audience, which is both a good exercise for a writer, since that is what we do, and also in a pure, plain, um, self-serving way, a chance to kind of keep people engaged. I don't write lots of books. I, I feel like I'm rather spottily productive, so this is a, an opportunity for me. I mean, there's nothing that hurts more than when you run into someone and say, oh, are you still writing for The New Yorker? You think, just go ahead, take a gun and shoot me, and that'll be less painful. But um, there, there is a chance to, to talk to readers in an informal way, in a casual way that I, I like. I like that opportunity. I also think, you know, I have to confess, I, when I began posting um, my word count, you know, I had read somebody who had used Twitter to help lose weight um, because he would post sort of his calorie count for a day, and I thought, oh, that's so sick, I'm going to do that. Um, <laughs> so I, I began, you know, you have, uh, it, depending on how many people are following you, you have a lot of people out there who, I mean, look, this goes back to where I began with this whole talk here is that who would have dreamed that total strangers would be curious if you were sticking to your diet? I mean, I think that's exciting. I know that sounds odd, but we are really interested in each other. People are really interested in stories. And that has not diminished. And more, I think more than that, it's just grown and grown. And a feeling of intimacy with, with other people, with knowledge, it's there, it's growing, and for writers, it's a chance to embrace this as, as a mission more and more, as a, an opportunity to say, I'm, I'm a good talker, that's what I do, and that's what all of us in this room are, because you wouldn't be a writer if that weren't the case. And the chance to talk to people in many different formats has never been more available. This doesn't mean if you don't like writing 140 characters, you don't have to. But I just point to that to say, whatever anyone tells you about the gloom and doom in, in this industry, they can't begin to tell you that people have lost interest in each other because everything suggests that that's not the case. Well, this might sound like pure cheerleading. Um, I have to confess, it really is. I, I feel like being a writer is not just a privilege, but as I said before, it's a real joy. It's a chance to do something amazing, to to help people understand the world around them better because we do this as people who have slightly more acute skills of observation or interpretation or description or synthesizing, finding out lots of information and bringing it together so it makes some sense. What a joy that is. And as you go out into the world, I think it's important to be reinvigorated to remember what a, a kind of glorious pursuit this is and what a great chance it is to do something that matters and that lasts. And that's what I, I think as much as I'm staring at my word count and suffering as we all do under deadlines and, and some of the more mundane parts of being a, a professional writer. I never forget the pleasure of imagining someone reading something and feeling that they saw the world in a new way. 
Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. So um, I'm just going to ask you for really good questions. Whom are you writing for? Who, when, you, when you're sitting down to write, who, who is your target audience? Is there some, some composite, or is it just for everybody? Um, that's a good question, and I think it's uh, funny because one of one of the things that I I think is worrisome about um, people who are writing blogs only, which is that there's a complete lack of a sense of who the audience is, um, and I, I think that does inform not so much the way you write, but your experience of it being communication. It's not, it shouldn't just be that you're slapping words on the page, but that you're, you're also imagining how they're being consumed. So it was a, a very funny thing for me to go from writing when I first got started, writing for an alternative news weekly in a relatively small city where I felt like I could literally see who was reading and almost picture that person to going to writing for a national magazine where it was a much stranger feeling of it being like out in the world without that same concrete sense of an audience. Now I think the, the person I imagine is, I, while this sounds very predictable, I think I imagine it as someone like me who is, um, I mean, a lot of what I'm kind of reaching for is the idea of somebody who is not knowledgeable about what I'm writing about, but willing to learn, but doesn't need to know every gritty detail. That it's a person with a great interest in the world without any plan to be completely soaked into a subject. And I, that may sound a little vague, but um, I do imagine my stuff being read. I don't just write it. Um, I, as I'm working, I'm, my husband reads everything that I'm writing, and so in a sense I'm, I'm writing, he's my first audience, and so his reaction, I, I you know, particularly because a lot of what I'm interested in, he begins with the, the skepticism that probably every do, everyone does, which is, you know, why would you write about mules? Why would you write about, you know, a toothless guy who stole orchids? So I'm, I'm doing my, oh, well, no, no, wait. This is really interesting. I'm serious. Um, so I start with a, a skept, an intelligent, skeptical person who I'm married to. <laughs> Someone else? So you talked about um, what draws you to a story initially. And how much does that question drive the whole long process of writing a story? And I guess what I'm really interested in is sometimes the story changes. Do you have to hold on to your question to keep your motivation? Do you always fight to get it in? Do you let it change and drop the initial question? I think that's a, a great um, part of the process, which is, I feel like a story that doesn't change while you're working on it is probably not that interesting of a story. Or that you're not open enough. Um, I write about stories because I want to learn about them. In the process of learning, you would really hope that what you learn throws you off from where you started. And I honestly feel that it's a it's very uncomfortable to me if things are falling exactly as I predicted, that I begin losing interest in the story. Where I get intrigued is I start with a question, um, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, and I, the more I learn, the more I realize, wow, that wasn't the question at all. That, that may have been why I got into the story, but in fact, it's going off in this entirely different direction and and that's where I feel that I'm really I'm really doing the right job as a writer which is I'm letting the story take me where it's supposed to go not impose I mean I think the the great failure 
I'll, I'll give you a few examples. When I first started writing, um, I was a stringer for a news weekly, which will go unnamed. And they called me and said, um, we're doing a story about um, kids who turn in other kids for dealing drugs. And I said, oh, you know, great. And they said, so we would love, I was living in the Northwest. We'd love a couple of examples from the Northwest. And, you know, this is how, at least then, Newsweeklies did things. They came up with an idea, and then they called all the stringers and said, give us a quote. So I found this girl. Um, I don't remember how I found her, but anyway, the more I started looking into it, I realized that, in fact, she was a drug dealer, too. This was in, She was ratting out her rival, and I thought, oh, my God, this is a great story. You know, this is... This is really interesting because the school was siding with her, but in fact, you know, because it was convenient for them to, because she was ratting out these kids who were drug dealers, but they were choosing to ignore the fact that she was actually as big a drug dealer. And I told, I called my editor, I said, oh no, but I've got this great story. And they said, well, it doesn't fit. I mean, because we already have our idea. And I thought, but it, it's, you know, I can't, I, I thought, but what does that mean? You have the idea. I mean, I'm, you know, in this case, of course, it was one example. But it was, to me, a really revealing moment where I thought, but that doesn't make sense to me. If I decide in advance what the story is, then why even do it? Or why do reporting to sit there and write your story? Um, you know, I, I mean, seriously, if if your choice is it's going to be this way, I mean, almost none of my stories quite ended up where I thought they would. And um, in many cases, there's the experience of total disaster along the way where the source you thought would be the most interesting turns out not to be and so on and so forth. But that's where it gets interesting. Absolutely. And... You know, I feel lucky because I hate writing proposals for that reason. I think, how could I write and tell you what a story or a book is going to be about if I haven't done it yet? Isn't learning the whole point? So I'm the world's worst proposal writer. Worst. Um, for, and, you know, where I just say, I don't know. I want to I go find out. And I really encourage as much as you can do that, you know, to even with your editors, emphasize the point that your job is to learn stuff. Not to know it in advance, but to go out and learn it and be the best learner and the smartest learner and then be the best teller of that story. Yes, ma'am? You know, the obvious stuff is always going to be out there, and don't young writers have to do sort of what you did in this case, is find the story that everybody isn't writing? Absolutely. Um, I tell my students all the time that, um, and certainly at The New Yorker, we are, this is a huge part of our value, is coming up with stories. I think we've gotten, I mean, to me that's at least 50% of the battle. The story that isn't obvious or the oblique, interesting approach to the big central news story, um, that is, that's everything almost. Uh, and, you know, or you're the one of a pack of people writing the same story. How can you do it in a way that's more original? I'm kind of amazed and slightly disheartened by how hard it was. I teach at NYU, and um, when I'd say, you know, I gave them assignments, and then for their last paper, I said, you know, up to you. And they all looked at me with horror, and I thought, what? You know, how old are you? You're already bored with the world? But um, it was, you know, I think that obviously it's something you you develop a story sense. You You get more experience in figuring out what has the the heft to actually be a story versus something that isn't. But I think you have to be a little daring. And and the the ten year old man piece. I mean, God knows, I didn't know what I was getting into. 
But at the time, I thought, well, Macaulay Culkin, how boring. Um, and I'd done a lot of celebrity profiling, and I thought, oh, you know, you know exactly what you're going to get, and his manager will be there, and it's just going to be, uh, I could do that without even doing the reporting. You know, it's really fun being in movies, and, you know. Um, and I just thought, well, what's more exotic is to find a completely ordinary kid of the same age. And believe me, it was a lot harder of a story because as you're writing about something ordinary, you are filled constantly with this feeling of what on earth, why would anyone care about this? And how can I justify that this is actually a story? And that's where you have to override it with a sense of confidence that I am going to make this a story you're going to want to hear. And that everything is... Everything has the potential to be a good story. I really believe that. Everything does. If you care about it, it, it could be a great story. The, the subjects you choose, if part of why you're writing about them is their ordinariness, um, it's a, it can be a really slightly scary, you know, some of those stories are the ones that I felt the most unnerved, thinking, oh God, what am I doing? I mean, who, you know, I sat down to write a, a story about a hair salon, and I thought, I'm writing a story about a hair salon. You know, what, how, how on earth can I make this seem like a story, let alone a story people should read, let alone a story people should read in The New Yorker? And then I thought, because it's just so cool the way people hang out there and interact and it's this sort of social little pod that exists and it's funny and the people are interesting and it's a slice of life and who doesn't appreciate a, a great snapshot that makes you go oh I I know what that's like or that reminds me of something I'm familiar with but it's a it's all about confidence I think and I think for young writers, the confidence to say a story about my chickens, it's a fabulous story, it's hard to do. But I think you've got to work on that. You've got to have the nerve to say, you have to have the capacity to make it interesting and you do have to have the nerve to say to your editor, I believe this is a good story. Let me, let me have a chance. Yes. Do you find that you gravitate toward the same type of stories that you like to write? And, and would you care to share with us a few stories or, or books that you've read recently that you really enjoyed? I read mostly fiction in my, um, in my spare time, actually. And I, I think it's uh, partly reading for the pl just the pleasure of being in another mental space rather than reading nonfiction, but also for language, for technique that I'm cur you know, I'm very interested in. And I'm, right now I'm reading um, The Imperfectionists, the, that happens to be about in a newspaper, but, um, and then I did actually uh, read, I started reading The Emperor of All Maladies um, before that, which is nonfiction, but the, all the books before that were, were novels. When I'm writing, I keep on my desk all of the books that I, you know, it's almost like I rub them thinking somehow like the, that it will just flow through osmosis into me. Um, you know, I have a, a couple of very well-worn books that sit on my desk. Um, uh, Joan Didion, The White Album, um, John McPhee, Giving Good Weight, um, a collection that I happen to love uh, called The Literary Journalists. It's got an enormous number of pieces in it that I really love. Um, Great Plains by Ian Frazier. You know, these are... Um, and uh, in Patagonia, Bruce Chatwin. These are the ones that I had around me while working, actually both on The Orchid Thief and on Rinton Tin. And, you know, it's not that they were similar in any way, but I would turn to them all the time when I was very stuck. 
and just try to see how another writer solved a problem that I was having structurally. A um, couple of other ones, too. I, I also have an A.J. Liebling collection that I keep out there and um, up in the old hotel, Joseph Mitchell. All quite different tones in all these books, but um, they're like totems for me. And, and many times they do help. You know, they, they kind of, you're stuck. You can't figure out how to, say, introduce a new character into a scene, and it just feels really awkward. And I, I flip through, and I may see the way Liebling did it, and I think, oh, well, I, some version of that I can try. I just believe, though, you should read as much as you can and as many different things as you can as a writer. I think it's really important. Yep, back there. What are your thoughts on writing and on reading celebrity profiles, and what do you think makes a truly great celebrity profile? Ooh, wow. Celebrity profiles. Oh, my <laughs> God, yeah. I, I mean, in fact, among my most hated pieces of journalism in the last decade were a couple of different celebrity profiles where I was literally screaming. Cause, but it was more that I was outraged by the, the writer's interference in it. I mean, the fact is, it's a really weird form. And actually, Gay should talk to you about it, not me, because... He's the king, and um, I, you know, it's a funny thing. You, you make a, a devil's pact with a celebrity that you're using them, they're using you, and I think the, there's a, a, a funny thing that happens where you convince yourself that actually, I'll tell you a horror story because it's kind of funny. Um, one thing that happens is because you're around a celebrity, you get very dazzled and you think that they actually really like you. Um, so years ago, when I was writing a lot for Rolling Stone, I was asked to profile Tom Hanks. And I was sharing an office at the time with another writer. And uh, I said, oh, I'm going to interview Tom Hanks. He said, God, that's so funny. I just got asked by New York Magazine to profile Tom Hanks. And I said, OK. And the next day he came in and he said, and this is so weird, my wife, who's a writer, also got asked to profile Tom Hanks <laughs> for the Daily News. And I thought, oh, I guess Tom Hanks has some time on his hands. So, um, you know, it was a, kind of a funny feeling to have all of us working on the same really groundbreaking <laughs> story. So I went to my interview, and Tom Hanks is a very charming, really nice guy, very smart, really good guy. And before I went in, I was told by his manager's manager's manager that, um, you know, he was on a tight schedule. He was promoting a movie, big surprise. This is why I was doing all these interviews. And he said, you know, you, we can do like 20 minutes. And I said, all right. Um, and that 20 minutes came and went, and Tom, Tom Hanks is chatting, very, having a lot of fun. And he said, you know, um, I'm starved. You want to go have some lunch? And I thought, yes, yes. And we're sitting at lunch, and I don't know what we were talking about, but he suddenly said to me, you know, I never, I always thought I was really ugly. I, I've always considered myself really ugly. And I thought, wow, we are getting really close. You know, he's like sharing this with me. And I, you know, I felt like, wow, we're, we're kind of friends, actually. <laughs> so the next day, I came into my office, and I was feeling, you know, like I didn't want to rub it in. But I said to my office mate, well, how did your 20 minutes go with Tom Hanks? He said, actually, it was great. I mean, it ended up being more like two hours. And he said, and it was amazing. At one point, he said to me, he told me, confessed to me, <laughs> that he always has considered himself ugly. <laughs> and he said, how did, your, how did your time go? And I said, oh, you know, it, it was great. It was, it was really good. Yeah, we got close. 
And it was, this is a long story, but the bottom line was, it was this revelation that, of course, it's not that Tom Hanks is evil. It's that celebrity profiling is this different animal, which is why I, I, in, I did a fair share of it. I kind of enjoyed it, and then I wanted really badly to get away from it and to write about people who didn't have as much invested in managing the outcome of the story and who it, it wasn't quite the same. Um, it was a transaction doing a celebrity profile. And they they got something out of it, you got something out of it, and I I really loved moving away from that, which is why the Macaulay Culkin thing, I thought, you know, I don't, I just don't want to do that story. But now that I think about it, a 10-year-old boy, wow, now that's exotic. I can't imagine what goes in, on in those heads. Um, and I'm not sure I really gave you an answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> Was that useful in any way? Okay. Yeah? Thanks. Uh, I'm wondering if you can speak a little about um, how living in a rural environment has um, informed um, your writing, storytelling, story selection, if at all. Um, I think that wherever you are actually has a big effect on what you write about. Because for me, so often, stories emerge naturally. It's something that I stumble across. So where I am has a big effect on what, what stories I end up coming across and, and being curious about. Um, th the funny thing is that I think it would have been very different 20 years ago to be living where I live and writing. You know, the isolation would have been so much more extreme. Now, it it doesn't feel that different from when I was living in New York and writing. But, you know, I have, I just am coming across so many different stories that just wouldn't emerge when I was living in New York. It's probably why it was a nice switch. I mean, not that I felt that my I was getting stale, but I like having a whole different world informing my curiosities. Also, you can't beat having four huge turkeys pecking on your office as if they're saying, are you done yet? Are you done? You know, that's an experience I think, wow, this is so not Manhattan. <laughs> yes, in the back? It actually goes with that. I do think you are really inspiring and motiva motiva motivating, I guess, and you have an energy with the audience, and you've even cited a couple things with energy from your husband and your six-year-old and even the turkeys pecking on your window. I picture that and I wonder, so how do you sit at a computer and write and stay motivated um, without being undistracted by gaining further research and you love that learning process or being distracted even by your family? So how do you stay motivated at a computer? Um, boy, it, that is a huge question. Um, a couple of answers. One is there's just the simple reality of a deadline. And when I first came to The New Yorker, we didn't have deadlines, and I found it terrifying. I think it does no one any good not to have a deadline. Secondly, um, you know, I think this is a topic for another conference of just women, because <laughs> I really think that, I mean, seriously, um, and there may be some, like, super dads here in the audience, but I think it is a gigantic overwhelming, challenging thing to be a woman with a kid being a writer. It's really hard. I think it's hard to be a woman with a kid having any kind of job, but a job that is so amorphous that takes a kind of mental absorption um, and that doesn't happen when you want it to happen. You know, you don't just make yourself write or feel inspired, it can be really hard. I try to be, um, when, I'm, when I'm working, I try to demystify it as much as I can. You know, I don't have, I, 
I try to look at myself as a word factory. And I find it very helpful to be, just treat it as this is my job and I've got to do a thousand words today. I think it really helps to, to have parameters that are really simple and clear and, um, you know, to contrast to the, all the sort of self-criticism and, you know, the doubt as you're writing, just to have this very simple fact. I'm trying to write a thousand words today and I'm going to sit here till I get those thousand words done. I found it really helpful. I did that, that for the first time when I was writing The Orchid Thief and I was simply overwhelmed because every day you'd sit down, even if you had a good day, you still weren't done with the book. So my editor suggested, well, just break it into these little pieces. And one day you do one piece and the next, the next. And um, you can then look at your calendar and guess roughly when you're really going to be done. And I found it very helpful. Um, so I'm motivated by keeping, you know, creating these incredibly simple, plain um, systems and then sheer and utter fear of being late on deadlines and not getting stuff done. Yes, over there. Um, I'm wondering when you tend to fall in love with subjects so much, how do you decide what details make it into a piece? Like, How much do you decide to leave out before you even start writing? And how much happens in revision? I write from, uh, let's see, how would I? You know, I, I believe in a certain economy as I'm writing. I don't write really long pieces, and I don't, I, I try to be spare with details so that they're all only the very best details. Um, but it's not, uh, so, but I think in order to get to that, I collect as many as I can. I also try to spend as much time as I can with subjects where I'm not less as a reporter and more being in the moment and, and really learning it. Um, this is a funny thing that just it, it occurred to me recently that I always spend a fair amount of time working on stories where I'm not taking any notes. And I'm not an obsessive note taker. I'm not even a very good note taker. But I am a good observer. And I think that um, I'm not talking about write every story from memory because when it comes to quotes, I want them to be exact and correct. And I don't see any squishy area there. But I think we're all so worried about note-taking and writing stuff down, and you think, but if you left here and wanted to describe me, you haven't taken out any notes, and you probably would do a better job because you were really letting yourself get absorbed in listening and being here. It, I, I actually feel like it's a... It's an exercise that you should try a bit, which is put away your tape recorder and your notebook and just be in the experience. I I'm really am not a great note taker. And when I'm writing descriptions in particular, a lot of it is coming much more out of my synthesizing what I observed. And a lot of times that is not anywhere in my notes. It's the way I would tell it if I came back from a trip and said, oh my God, I had a great time in Boston. I did X, Y, Z. The weather was such and so. But that's not from notes. That's from knowing it. And I think the best stories have that feeling that the person writing it really knows what they're talking about and they're telling it to you rather effortlessly. That it's just the way, I mean, I feel like stories at their very best should feel told that the, the mechanism of a page in print is just a convenience, that you can hear the person telling you the story. And I think that's got to come out of more a feeling that you actually know what you're talking about. And I would really encourage you to try spending some time 
I mean, facts, you can always go back and look up and get the fact, you know, make sure you've got the fact right. But really knowing the story, you should be knowing it without a notebook. You should have a feeling of what you want to say and what you're trying to say. And then the details become kind of obvious in a more natural way. Back before you were this Susan Orlean, how did you sell book proposals based on, well, I'm, I'm curious about this. What did you put into them? What was, what was your storytelling then? My very first book, Saturday Night, came about because I said to a publisher, you know, I've always kind of wondered about Saturday Night. <laughs> and that was my book proposal. And I'm not trying to say, I mean, I, I am really a bad proposal writer, and in this case, I think, um, I would say, number one, you know, as much as you possibly can, if you have a book to sell, if you can go and meet with editors in person, it's so valuable, and this really is what happened to me. I was a complete novice, and I, I'm, I really, you know, I was living in Oregon at the time, writing for a little alternative news weekly, so it's not that I came with some fabulous credential. I met with an editor. I just said, you know, I probably was just saying, you know, ah, I love writing, ah, I love, you know, books, fabulous, fantastic. And, and then, you know, and I said, well, and I, have the, I had come up with a story, a book proposal that sounded like a good book. And she said to me, I don't think you really want to do this book, do you? I said, actually, no. What I really want to do is I just always wondered about Saturday night and like, is it the same everywhere? Does everyone care about it? She said, great, I love it, done. The, the fact is that while that probably happens a lot less in this day and age, there I, I think the personal relationship with the editor and saying to her, I'm burning to do this and uh, you know, it's not like they gave me a fortune, but they did give me a book contract and and the freedom to go do that book, the book I really wanted to do. Um, I think the less you do market research, and actually, this was really interesting. I was reading something the other day about Steve Jobs, and Apple never does market research, never. He said, I, I don't care what people think they want. I want to think of something amazing they're going to want. So while I think there's some truth to that, I think to sit there and think, well, it's kind of like Eat, Pray, Love, but with a, you know, a horse theme, <laughs> you know. I mean, that's why Hollywood makes such bad movies, because that is the way movies get figured out. If you come and say, I am dying to do this book, I, I will figure it out by doing it. I think a smart editor, it, you know, if you say I'm, I'm going to be good at this, is, is going to get it. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm realistic. I know that's not always going to happen. But I think that the authentic enthusiasm you have will matter a lot. But I really urge you, I could never put that on a page. I could never explain it in a proposal, but I certainly could in person. Okay, last question. Who's it? Is it really good? You, f you feel it's a really good one? Do you feel yours is better? <laughs> Isabel, I, d I don't know. My choice. Um, all right, you know what? I, I think we're going to have to do two. All right, okay. First, our Danish friend. I think the question is how do you describe um, character traits that are, I mean, in other words, how do you describe someone who has negative qualities without being really cruel? Um, you know, I've written a lot about a lot of people I don't like, but I think in the context of writing about I, I I think <laughs> that's a tough one. I mean, I, I'm first of all very conscious of how painful 
reading about yourself can be. And so while I'm not a Pollyanna and I'm not going to describe everybody as being fantastic, I, I feel like words are so powerful that you a little goes a long way. And that I would rather let the person's behavior present their behavior and let the reader draw the conclusion rather than me characterizing someone. You know, and describe, you know, it's the classic showing instead of telling. And I think it's Im especially important with negative characterizations that it's a lot better to sh let someone play out on the page and let the reader understand on their own what, what that adds up to. And now... You've been a really good cheerleader, and um, I feel like I can give me enough gas to be a mom and a writer for at least another day or two. Uh. Uh, <laughs> but I was wondering, did you ever have a moment where you almost walked away from the profession or just needed to take a break? Um, you know, I, I think t I certainly never, ever did till I had a kid. Um, it just wouldn't have occurred to me in a million years. I just thought, wow, I won the lottery. I love what I do. I, I you know, I love it. Um, I, I'm really exhausted from finishing my book. And right now I think, boy, I have no ambition at all. I'm done. I'm, I'm just, you know, and a lot of it is feeling that I, my kid is, growing up and I'm, I'm so, sort of missing it and I don't know really, you know, when you finish one story or one book, a lot of times you think that's it. There simply are no more good ideas in the world. Um, I certainly need a break and I think that it's now the constancy of, you know, promoting a book is so much more intense than it, was 10 years ago that I, I kind of dread, I don't dread it, but I just know how intense and constant it will be. But I am unqualified to do any other job. I have no other skills. So <laughs> it's not, I'm unemployable, actually. <laughs> Thank you very much. I really appreciate it.